Well, Keith, uh, <laughs> please. Uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm not sure it's deserved, but uh, I'll leave you to be the judge of that after I've uh, finished. Um, now, I know I was supposed to start at quarter past, uh, so that we'd finish at 11 and leave plenty of time for discussion. Can you give me some guidance as to um, how long we'll go for? Well, I was pushing, every, pushing everything back by 15 minutes. Right, OK, so we've still got three quarters of an hour. Yes. OK, because I definitely want to leave a lot of time for discussion, and uh, I've got about 25 minutes' worth of things to say, and I've already taken two minutes, so uh, uh, let's get on with it. Um, <coughs> I am going to use uh, one or two um, uh, slides, images, just to get certain points across, but uh, um, mostly I'm going to talk. Um, so welcome everyone, thanks very much for coming. Thank you uh, Keith and Shift and Friends of the Earth and the Green Party and everyone else who's been involved in putting on today. Um, it's actually, uh, I'm really pleased to be here and it's, it's uh, um, my opportunity um, and, um, and so I'm very grateful for that. Um, we're told repeatedly that the cuts are essential, that there's um, no alternative to austerity. It's an imperative, uh, almost uh, like a gospel handed down from on high. It's certainly been handed down from on high. I'm not sure that it quite qualifies as a gospel. Um, and that we've got no option but to tolerate and support and encourage this brutal dismantling of our economy and society that we see going on all around us. Uh, most recently under the coalition, previously um, uh, the seeds well sown <coughs> under new labour. But as I hope everyone in this room understands, there is an alternative. Yeah, we know that the debt has to be tackled. We know that we've got to learn to live within our economic and our environmental means. We know that we've got to balance the books. But you can't do that by handing power to unelected corporations, by chucking a million kids onto uh, a social scrap heap, by trashing the planet. In Hailsham's famous phrase, we have an elected dictatorship, but these emperors have no clothes. And it's up to us to expose that. And I think one of the wonderful things that's happening under shift is not only making the link between climate change solutions and economic and social solutions, but that this is about alliance building. It's about overcoming the splintering that's happened within progressive movements over the last 20 years, where so many people do so many things, but it's always in parallel. And never is critical mass reached that really makes a difference in the ballot box. And why governments and ministers behave as they do is because they know that so far, at least, there's been no electoral price to pay. And that's what we have to change. Now, um, someone didn't show me how to use this thing. So if I want to move on, do I press? No, I don't press those. I press this. Yeah, perfect. Um, this isn't coming up very well, but uh, no, there's no red button there. Anyway, look, the first thing to do is to get a sense of scale and proportion as to what's happening to our planet as a result of governments and corporations, but virtually every single citizen on the planet. We are destabilizing the, the biosphere. Climate change is one symptom of that destabilization. Civilization has grown up in a stable 10,000 year period, which in a sense is unprecedented. What we're doing now is that we're tipping the balance back into making everything chaotic again in this complex system of the interaction between the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land. And what this slide, if you can read it, demonstrates is where the big picture movements are happening. The melting of the Greenland ice sheet, the instability of the West Antarctic ice sheet, the changes in Antarctic bottom water formation which drive currents around the world, warm and cold, 
which influence our climate and determine our weather patterns. Of um, shifts in the West African monsoon, and Indian monsoon chaotic uh, instabilities. Of the permafrost and tundra loss, of a climate induced ozone hole, of Atlantic deep water formation systems changing. And there is enormous inertia in this system. So once things start happening, they're very, very difficult to change or redirect. And the changes that we now see happening, simply put, through greenhouse gas emissions, are driving us into a period, as we've seen, of enormous climatic and weather instability, which threatens not the planet, but civilization. That's how serious it is. This is not an exaggeration. This is a physics and chemistry and biology, whatever the climate deniers say. And the consequences of lo losing the sinks for greenhouse gas emissions, whether they're forests or the ocean capacity to absorb carbon dioxide or the soil's capacity to do the same, results in the momentum carrying on into instability. And we can't live with instability. Look at what's happening in just the weather impact so far. We haven't even begun to see the sea level rise that is imminent. And a third of human beings live in, within one meter of the sea level, in terms of sea level rise. So if Antarctic, West Antarctic, or Greenland go, we're in big, big problem. They don't completely have to melt, they just have to melt as rapidly as they're currently doing. So, you know, for the oldies amongst us, we may be able to survive. For the youngsters amongst you, for my son, who's 25, it's not a good future. Ocean acidification, species extinction, fisheries collapse, resource depletion, all these things are reinforcing each other. There's an ecological balance sheet which has to be paid, which our economies and society at the moment are not doing. But there's no point in getting bummed out about it. We've got to do something about it. And the good news is, is that everywhere you look, in every society, in every country, there are solutions galore that just need multiplying and deepening and broadening. We've got the money, we've got the technologies, we've got the cooperative spirit, we've got the people, we've got the imagination. The only thing that's missing is the political will. That's what we have to generate to put these solutions into place. I'm an Aquarian. I am not a doomster and a gloomster, but I am real realistic. We have to face up to the scale of the challenge. Otherwise, the scale of the solutions simply won't be enough. And that's what I think that SHIFT uh, presents an opportunity for doing. And it's not just about the ecology of the place that we live, our planet or our locality. It's about the enormous, deep and broad inequalities of race, of wealth, of status that drive countries apart that are apparent between and within nations and between and within generations. It's not just to do with social justice, it's also to do with our economy, which is collapsing all around us. And the people in charge say, actually what we need is more of the same. It's absolutely not what we need. We need a different development model that we know exists. We know what its character and constitution is like. It just needs to be put into place. And that's what so much of the Green New Deal uh, is about. So, we face this greatest challenge of any human generation. So what do we do? Get scared? Freak out? Yeah, there's plenty to be scared about. But fear paralyzes. Fear doesn't enable. Is it time to get angry? Yeah, it's definitely time to get angry. Angry about what's happening and who's responsible. But actually, all of us are in a way responsible. Because if you don't do the right things, you're helping the wrong things happen. And anger has got a lot of energy in it. But it's a negative energy. It needs to be redirected. And that's why I think that we need to look at solutions. 
and the part of the solutions is ourselves and who we can work with. And hope comes from realising that solutions exist. And hope is a powerful, positive energy. And hope leads to commitment. And commitment says, yes, we're going to do things differently. And doing leads to action. And so out of action, together, can come that rollout of the solutions that we need. Locally, nationally, and globally. We've got to believe that it's possible to do. I certainly do believe that it's possible to do. And the Green New Deal is about doing that. It's about valuing natural capital and human capital. Valuing the planet, valuing society for what they're really worth, as if they actually mattered. Now business as usual doesn't do this. Business as usual stock market valuations are utterly and hopelessly at odds with nature's balance sheet and with the long-term policy drivers such as the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that we can already see slowly coming into place that movements like this can accelerate. And yet, what do we see? Hundreds of billions of pounds in our economy alone tied up in the value of fossil fuel reserves underground, oil and gas and coal that we simply cannot afford to burn. And yet, so much of the wealth in society, if you have pension funds, so much of your pension is tied up in using those fossil fuels. So it's a sort of suicidal mission that our economy is driving us on. But how long will those stock market valuations and the value of those pensions for the mainstream of voters stay in place? Five of the top ten FTSE companies are virtually exclusively carbon enterprises. One of them, Shell, provides 12% annually of all pension returns in this country. So pension funds and those companies and the pension holders are going to fight like crazy to keep things as they are because their future is tied up in it unless we afford a transition into a different way of doing things, a different way of using those pension funds. And those five companies account for 25% of the total FTSE valuation. So we've got to do things differently. We've got to embark on a transition to a sustainable economy, one that looks after the planet and looks after ourselves. And yeah, that is possible to do. And I'm going to run through a few of the things that I think are necessary to do just that. And it's about leading to transformation. Transformation from top to bottom, from left to right, and across the centre. Our buildings. Our buildings are in a terrible state. They leak energy. I mean, one of the reasons why we have such ridiculously high energy bills is because we just heat the atmosphere. You probably know, and Schiff certainly does, about the enormous number of jobs that have been created in every single constituency in the country through a systematic energy efficiency program of municipal buildings, of households, of offices, <coughs> of, um, uh, uh, of factories. We can create hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of jobs in this way. And that's not an exaggeration. We can see what happens in other countries where they do the same thing and then scale up and come to the calculation that makes sense. Environmental, economic, and social sense. That's what sustainable development is all about. 4% of our um, energy currently comes from renewables. But that's because the policy framework isn't there, like it is in Germany, to help those small, medium, and large-sized renewables really embed themselves and provide resilient households and resilient <coughs> communities and affordable energy bills. It's not just about solar or offshore wind. There's wave power. There's combined heat and power. Where you trap heat energy and reuse it to generate electricity or to warm buildings directly. Our biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions comes from heating buildings. This is the type of closed loop system that tackles the problem at source and does so um, effectively. And then there's, there's obviously 
um, uh, anaerobic digestion, the enormous amount of food waste that we dump at the moment. That is actually a fuel source for anaerobic digestion to be able to produce um, electricity and biogas. And then there's the regeneration of our local woodlands to provide local biomass. So, huge opportunities there. An integrated rail, bus, cycle, pedestrian network, please. Can we re uh, can we um, renationalize British Rail? Yeah, we bloody well should do. Because under the private companies, it's an absolute disaster. The costs of uh, t taxpayer subsidy have gone up two or three times since um, the rail system was privatized. We've got some of the most expensive rail fares, or the most expensive rail fares in Europe. And it doesn't make any sense. Of, you know, we've got 6% um, uh, ticket prices coming in January. No, we need to do things very differently there as well. So here is a, an infrastructure opportunity just waiting to happen. And it's critical that we get the buses. The only place that the buses really work in this country is Transport for London, because they're not privatised. Everywhere else, it's just local monopolies playing off against each other, driving up fares, cutting services, and not providing what people need, which is an easy way, a <coughs> universal service that allows people to move around the country. We can do that. We used to do it. We can do it again. The closed-loop circular resource economy, based on collection, on separation of waste, on recycling, on reuse, on remanufacturing. Again, we know how this works in Sweden, or in Germany, or in Norway. It's not about taking things to landfill. It's about creating job opportunities and economic opportunities out of treating waste as valuable resources. That's what we should be doing. That's what we can do. And it's about um, broadband and smart infrastructure. I mean, you think you get bombarded with these uh, adverts for smart TVs and smart phones. It, it, it's just the beginning. Within 10, 20 years, we're going to have smart cities, smart neighborhoods, smart utilities, smart public services, smart appliances, smart machinery, where your fridge will be talking to your washing machine through, it, they literally, I mean, it's already happening. They've already got the trials uh, uh, occurring to determine when is the most effective way to turn itself on so that you use the cheapest electricity. And the utility, being able to have this smart interconnected system and network, being able to determine when to bring cheap energy on stream and when to keep expensive energy off stream. I mean, it sounds absolutely extraordinary, but it's literally just around the corner within the terms of a, 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 of a, of a generation. <laughs> We're used to the internet of people. It's the internet of things that's going to be taken over. With the new IP addresses that have now been established, there's enough uh, computer identity, if you like, labeling for 36 trillion, trillion, trillion products, appliances, things. That's what we stand on the threshold. And as artificial intelligence develops, these things won't just be dumb machinery, they'll be smart goods. Now, there are a whole load of dangers that go with this, which I don't have time to go into, uh, as you can probably imagine. But if one looks at it purely from a resource efficiency, and a uh, energy efficiency point of view. This is one of the very few things that might actually be able to reduce carbon emissions and accelerate resource use efficiency on a big enough scale globally while still allowing us to meet what are two of the biggest drivers of all. The two and a half, three billion people who are poor, who want to be middle class in the world, and the two, two and a half billion people who live in absolute poverty, who want any improvement in their living standards that they can get. And those social drivers are not going to go away. They have to be built into the equation of how we deliver sustainable development. It's not just the middle class and the wealthy who can afford to carry on in the way that they've been used to. Everyone wants that level of living standard and quality of life. So how do we deal with it? 
Well, it's through revolutionary changes like this, even as we have to um, uh, avoid the dangers and the pitfalls. Flood defences, agriculture, more opportunities for a Green New Deal. Sports facilities after the Olympics. For God's sake, why not give people the opportunity to be able to swim or cycle or play football or cricket or any of the uh, athletics or any of the games that people want to do, particularly now after the Olympics. It means building facilities as well as providing coaches. That's also part of the Green New Deal. As the government is slashing expenditure for arts and culture and museums, we're sort of hollowing out the spiritual and aesthetic side of our communities. We should be building them up, not just preserving those public expenditures, but expanding art galleries, expanding museums, upgrading them, and taking the national collections out of London and helping to reinvigorate communities across the country, economically, socially, and culturally. That's also part of the Green New Deal. And all this stuff equals jobs, jobs everywhere, not just for a privileged, educated few. It means greater tax revenues. It means less welfare payments. It means more prosperous communities. It means less pro poverty. It means people who are young in work. And above all, it means stability and value for money. It's about creating virtuous circles of reinforcement for the things that we want and minimizing what we don't want. So where's the money going to come from? Well, there are plenty of uh, opportunities for that too. Banks and capital. This pathetic little green bank that the government is uh, offering us is nothing. We need a proper green investment bank that is able to raise money, not just be given a grant every year uh, of a few hundred million quid. It needs to operate as a, as, a, as a proper bank with the power to raise capital. I mean, you know, we already own Royal Bank of Scotland as taxpayers, that money, uh, that, that, their assets should be going into developing <coughs> sustainable development. Where do they put their billions? They put them in things like tar sands in Canada. We own the Royal Bank of Scotland. We can use their assets to drive a sustainable economy and a sustainable market and make these investments happen. Pension funds, they're trillions of pounds in pension funds that need long-term, steady return, resilient investments, not fossil fuel investments. Those pension funds should be incentivized to invest in the type of infrastructure that the Green New Deal lays out. In Birmingham, I'll give you one example from Birmingham. Birmingham is spending £100 million on energy efficiency that's going to make 15,000 homes warm and cheap and cool in the summer to run. 40 public buildings by 2016 with those 15,000 homes. Then it's going to go on to do another 45,000 homes and 1,000 commercial buildings with private finance by 2020. It's a cooperative enterprise coordinated with 20 other local authorities. 10 public sector bodies, including the police, the fire, NHS, and schools. And it reckons that overall, after costs, it will bring nearly £300 million pumped back as investment into the Birmingham regional economy. 12,000 jobs, installation, servicing, engineers, designers, retail. Yeah, it's possible to do. But the biggest source of money comes from taxation. Not new taxes, but as the Tax Justice Network and uh, a member of the Green New Deal group, Richard Murphy, has pointed out, from getting the tax that we should have that currently flees the country, a hundred billion pounds of tax revenues lost every year. That's not a fictional figure. All the math has been done. 25 billion in tax loopholes. 25 billion in tax bills unpaid, between 50 and 70 billion, it's actually 120 billion perhaps, of illegal non-payment. It's not about new taxes, but it's about clamping down on the abuse of the system. Since the crash, HM Revenue and customers, customs, customers have cut 30,000 jobs, a third of their workforce. 
and another 10,000 are due to go by 2015. It's absurd. And the government says that it matters about tax evasion. It worries about tax evasion. No, it doesn't at all. These are one of the things we have to change. Each tax officer gains at least 11 times what their own individual um, costs are. And that's just under the current system before they really go after the people who aren't paying taxes. Of course they're fairer taxes. People who earn more should pay more. Those who pollute and waste should pay more. Those who hoard wealth and live off the enterprise of others should pay more. But we can design a tax system where poor people, people on low incomes, pay much less. Where small businesses, who are the generators of employment and so often of innovation in an economy, pay less. People on middle incomes as well pay less. And that householders, consumers and businesses who drive the green economy, they also should pay less. So the type of reforms that we need. Well, multinationals have to be made to account on a country-by-country -country basis um, through reporting where they operate so we know where they are, what they do, and how much tax they do or don't pay. The system doesn't exist at the moment. It's insane. That's why the Googles and the Amazons and everyone else gets away without paying any tax, because no one can really track them down without some sort of um, investigative journalism. It should just be part, standard part of our tax business system, so that corporations pay a fair share. Banks should report to the Treasury when businesses open accounts for companies and for, uh, um, and for small businesses, so we know what's going on. There should be a general anti-avoidance uh, mandate in UK tax law. And we must tackle the tax havens. Their only purpose is to undermine the laws of other countries. They let people who don't live there use their laws to undermine democracy and the laws and the responsibilities of the nations that they do live in. So we need country by country reporting on tax havens and the companies and the rich people who use them. And if they refuse, well, economic sanctions. Tax all income and payments that go into those countries. Those sort of flows, we know what they are. Deny banks a license to trade there. That would soon change things rapidly. We've got to build a progressive tax system. One where taxation on wealth and capital occurs properly. That frees the less well off from tax. That makes the polluter pay and rewards companies, households and consumers who invent, make, sell, use and buy clean, green, low or no carbon goods and services, technology and infrastructure, the fuels, the power, the machinery, the appliances, the closed loop material flows, the vehicles, the buildings. They should have lower tax rates. Taxation is not always about increasing things. It's about rewarding what you want more of and penalising what we want less of. It's about rewarding work and employment. You can reduce labour taxes and adjust income tax bans so that uh, people, companies want to hire. It's not expensive to hire. And shift some tax and spend raising powers from central government to local authorities. It's time to repower local government. Give them power over business rates, over council tax, and uh, being able to issue bonds to drive investment in the local community, and to open up the budget setting process on a participatory basis so that the electorate can have a say about what goes on, why, and how it should be administered. What sort of things are we talking about? A land value tax, for example. Which tax is a fair tax. It taxes capital wealth. It taxes what's on the land for what it's worth. It stops property speculation. It will bring a million empty homes and offices back into use because people will have to pay tax on what they could be used for. And you can adjust it so that there are all sorts of exemptions for the type of uh, use that you want to continue without it being driven up to a more productive um, or more intense um, uh, state of affairs. A carbon tax, obviously, is one of the most important green taxes. A waste and resource tax. A Tobin or transaction tax to stop currency speculation that does so much to distort supply and demand relationships and that has divorced 
wealth creation from job creation. Do you know in the United States, 70% of all share trades are high frequency trading and that the average time that a share is held is guess what? It's 22 seconds. 22 seconds because it's algorithms that are driving the margins where a few people can make a lot of money even as they don't take, pay taxes on what they do spend. So thank God for the Robin Hood uh, campaign to dampen that speculation and stop that type of casino, currency and commodity speculation. And that money can be used not only to regenerate our own economies, but we can use it to protect the global commons, like the Arctic, like the Antarctic, like the oceans, like the atmosphere. And for developing countries, you have critical global ecosystems, like uh, coral reefs and tropical <coughs> forests. We can use some of that money to help pay them to protect it, them and use them properly, conserve them for all our benefits and stop that destabilization of the biosphere. And we can use that money because it's a globally administered tax to make the UN Millennium Development Goals to lift these billions out of poverty and give them a decent standard of living and a high quality of life through sustainable development initiatives, make that a reality, not just an aspiration that governments boast about out of summits that mean absolutely nothing when it comes to delivering on the ground. It's about enforcing laws and regulations, making polluters and wasters pay for the damage they cause, driving the cowboys out of business, creating a level playing field where companies who are responsible can compete fairly. The end result will be a stable state economy a low zero carbon, a low zero waste economy. We'll have a national policy framework with long term targets providing the certainty the business needs to invest. We'll have a decentralized system where we put the local back into local government and give councils real authority and a mandate from their electorate. It's about providing those tax incentives, the public investment and the procurement that drive the creation of sustainable markets and sustainable economic and social activity. And this program of reform, as you can hear, is as much about politics as it is about the economy. The two sides of the same coin can't resolve economic problems unless we resolve political problems. We're dealing with a suicide administration. They don't care whether they get in next time round. They know they're not going to. They have one task, largely unspoken, which is to shrink the state. And you can see it everywhere. It's not just about uh, the NHS and health. It's about education. It's about local government. It's about welfare. It's about arts and culture. It's about fire and emergency service, including RAF search and rescue, which is about to be privatized. It's about the police. It's about defense. It's about environmental agencies. The objective is to marketize and privatize so that within this mandatory five-year program they've given themselves, they can avoid what Tony Blair failed to do. Blair's reform program got tied up in the civil service. The Orange Book liberals and the conservatives at the head of the uh, government are just going hell for leather to dismantle as much as possible in five years, privatize it, and outsource it so that it is really difficult to put things onto an alternative footing. Now, I'm not a lefty, you know, I'm certainly not a righty. I sort of believe in the German Greens of the early 1980s who said neither left nor right but forward. That's what we've got to do. That's what we can do, but we have to understand the scale and the consequence of the slashing of public spending and public funding and the awarding of contracts that are strip and the stripping away of the regulatory frameworks and democratic planning controls. It's utterly immoral, this slash and burn approach to government and to running our society. Adam Smith, not only turning, he must be revolving at high speed in his grave. The wealth of nations which started the Industrial Revolution and market economies 
is a book of moral economy. All the way through that book, Adam Smith says, you've got to look out for the people who are going to rip you off. You've got to have regulation. You've got to have state intervention. That's how markets work best under that type of positive framework for all. And that's what we need now. We need the political activism amongst mainstream voters and consumers, taxpayers and shareholders. We need them to be inspired, mobilized and organized so that we can hold our elected representatives to account. And if they don't vote for an agenda like this in Parliament, then we vote them out. And we can do that by working together. So the time has come to grant the coalition their wish. Put them out of their, but most importantly, our collective misery. We can't take Labour for granted, but what we can do is ensure that at election time, we only vote for politicians who are prepared to put sustainability first for the planet and for people. Thanks very much indeed for listening.